Today, we will look at a recent result on trilinear oscillator integral. And this is mainly based on work of Michael Christ. The main thing we're interested in is the following trilinear form. T lambda phi of F1, F2, F3 is defined to be the integration over the unit cube in R3 of an oscillator factor e to the i lambda phi of x times a threefold product of fi of xi. We can also define a multilinear version of this form by replacing the threefold product by an unfold product of fi of xi and do the integration on the unit cube in Rn. To give a short review of previous results, one important concept is the Newton polyhedra. Given a set of multi indices in dimension D, the Newton polyhedra generated by this is the convex hull of the union of each alpha i plus r plus to the D. And the reduced Newton polyhedra is defined similarly. The only difference is that the reduced Newton polyhedra will be generated by those multi indices with at least two non zero entries. Below is a picture with three given multi indices in dimension two. Here we are given one, two, two, one, and four, zero. And the blue part is the Newton polyhedron generated by these. The red part is the reduced Newton polyhedron. The difference is that for the reduced Newton polyhedron, one would throw away the last multi index because it only has one non zero entry. With this concept at hand, we are ready to present the result by von Stein and Sturm. So this theorem basically shows the role that Newton polyhedron plays in the decay rate of the following uh, multilinear oscillator interval. It states that given a set of multi indices in dimension D, suppose the phase function is a polynomial such that all the alpha i's derivative of the polynomial is bounded uniformly below on an algebraic domain D, then for any alpha contained in the reduced Newton polyhedron of the multi indices, this multilinear oscillator integral over D with phase function S will be bounded by O of lambda to the negative one over length of alpha times some power of log of one plus lambda times the product of LPJ norms of FJ. Here PJs are determined by the alpha here. To give an example, let's look at the previous uh, set of multi indices. Suppose we're in dimension two with a polynomial phase and an algebraic domain D satisfying that partial x, partial squared y of s and partial squared x, partial y of s and then partial x to the fourth power of s are all uniformly bounded below on the domain D, then the best decay rate we can expect as see in this red picture will be negative one third. The way to see that is to look at the intersection of the diagonal with the boundary of the reduced Newton polyhedron. And the inverse of that number will be the best decay exponent that one can achieve in this theorem. Of course, there's a loss of uh, powers of log one plus lambda. Later, Jilula, Grossman, and Xiao showed that if we impose some additional non-degeneracy condition on the phase function, it is possible to improve on the exponent pjs 
in the previous inequality. At this point, it is natural to ask whether one can get some better decay estimates, at least in some scenario, possibly under some more non-degeneracy assumption. So one way to interpret the main theorem we're going to present is that it answers this question in the case uh, when d equals three and when we are in the least de degenerate uh, condition. In other words, our multi-indices here are the simplest uh, ones possible. So the theorem states that for a broader class of functions, the real analytic functions, suppose that the phase function satisfies some non-degeneracy assumption, which we will specify in the next page, and suppose that all the mixed second order derivatives of phi does not vanish on the unit cube, then our trilinear form will be bounded by O of lambda to the negative gamma for some gamma strictly greater than one half. One point is that here this theorem is not concerned about getting a sharp priest exponent. Instead, we have that for any particular phi, there exists some gamma strictly greater than one half, such that um, the decay rate will be lambda to the negative gamma. Okay, to define the rank one non-degeneracy assumption, we say that a phase function is rank one degenerate on a hypersurface H, on a real analytic hypersurface H, if there exists Hj such that uh, the full gradient of phi tilde, which is phi minus summation over Hj of Xj, vanishes identically on the hypersurface H. To give a specific example, let phi of x be x1, x2 plus x2, x3 plus x1, x3. We see that for hi equals one half xi squared, this shows that phi violates the rank one non-degeneracy hypothesis. And if we choose fi to be e to the i lambda one half xi squared and plug in the trilinear form t lambda of fi, we see that the optimal exponent for the decay of t lambda of fi will be lambda to the negative one half. We can get nothing greater than that. This in some sense motivates the definition of the uh, rank one non-degeneracy assumption. However, it will be clear when we uh, look into the proof. The strategy of the proof is that we will eventually reduce a problem to a sub-level set estimate. And there, we will see the necessity and sufficiency of this uh, rank one non-degeneracy hypothesis. To achieve this reduction step, we shall decompose our function fi into Fourier series on intervals of length lambda to the negative delta for some delta strictly greater than one half. The heuristic behind this choice of spatial scale is the following. Write down the Taylor expansion of the phase function on each small cube, uh, which is a product of the intervals in the decomposition. We see that the contribution from the higher order terms or the contribution from all the terms with order greater than two, greater than or equal to two, will be bounded by lambda to the one minus two delta. When we choose delta to be strictly greater than, greater than or equal to one half, the contribution from those terms shall be very small. In other words, with this choice of spatial scale, we are actually using linear approximation for the phase function on each interval or each cube. 
Okay, another remark before we dive into the details of the proof is that the strategy of the proof for this theorem goes in some sense reversely uh, to the easier implication. We know that if we have a bound on a particular oscillator integral, that would imply a sublevel set estimate for the phase function. However, here the proof goes in the reverse direction. Okay, to start with the first reduction, we will restrict ourselves to the band limited functions because if we perform an integration map part, this shows that the high frequency parts of each uh, fi will contribute no more than O of lambda to the negative n to the oscillator integral. We can choose the cutoff for the frequency uh, cleverly here to make this uh, integration map part to work. A second reduction is that it suffices to prove the L infinity bound instead of the L2 bound because of Hohmann's theorem. So recall, we have a threefold integration. And if we freeze one of the variables, say x3 here, then the integration over the first two variables, for, the, for this integral, we can apply Hohmann's theorem and since we have a uniform lower bound on the mixed second order derivatives of phi on the domain, Hohmann's theorem will give us a decay of lambda to the negative one half times L2 norms of two of the fi's and L1 norm of the third one. Permuting the indices and interpolating with the L infinity bound will give us the desired L2 bound. So from now on, we can assume uh, fj is to be L infinity, and we shall assume their L infinity norms are less than or equal to one. And our goal now is to prove the L infinity bound instead of the L2 bound. We sometimes will write down the L infinity norm term to make our calculation a little bit clearer to see. Next, we do the decomposition as mentioned in the strategy part. We choose a spatial scale lambda to the negative one half and cutoff functions eta m. Here, m is the index for the interval. For each interval i m, we will write the Fourier series of fj times eta j m as follows. And we shall divide it into the G part and the H part. To do that decomposition, we first pick out all the terms whose Fourier coefficients are bounded above by lambda to the negative sigma times L infinity norm of Fg. Here, sigma is a parameter to be chosen later. And we call these terms H, J, M. The remaining terms forms the G, term, the G function. By our choice, all the remaining Fourier coefficients will be bounded below by lambda to the negative sigma. And a trivial bound will be, trivial upper bound will be O of L infinity norm of Fj. And by the Parseval's identity, there are at most lambda to the two sigma terms in the GJM. We shall exploit this dichotomy later in the proof. Another technicality is that by the band limited assumption on FJ, it is possible to throw away the tail terms in HJ. So actually hj, we can also assume that hj has a bounded number of terms, although the bound here is much worse than the bound on g, the number of terms in gj. 
Now we can write t lambda f as a six-fold sum. Here, we're summing over m1, m2, m3, and k1, k2, k3. m denotes the location in the domain, and k denotes the frequency in the phase function. We shall also write a new phase function, phi k, which is lambda to the one half k dot x plus lambda small phi of x. For these tuples m k, we can divide into the stationary parts and the non-stationary parts. Ah, here should be a less than or equal to sign. So we say a tuple km is stationary if gradient phi k evaluated at the center of the cube is less than or equal to constant times lambda to the one half plus rho. Rho shall be a very small parameter and Morally, we can think of it as zero for now. Observe that by an integration by parts, for all the non-stationary cubes or non-stationary tuples, their contribution is bounded by O of lambda to the negative n for any n. For the stationary ones, we will use the trivial bound, which is the size of the cube because we're integrating over a bounded function. So they have bound lambda to the negative three halves. Now, since we, are, we already divided f into g plus h, if at least one h term shows up in this trilinear form, we have the good property such that it's four coefficients uh, is bounded by lambda to the negative sigma. And once we exploit that, it remains to count the number of terms in this six-fold sum. And eventually, after an efficient counting, we see that there are, they make a contribution of at most lambda to the one plus constant times rho which eventually gives us a desired power, lambda to the negative one half plus constant times rho minus sigma. Recall that once we choose sigma, we can choose rho to be small as small as we like, so that this term gives us a power strictly smaller than negative one half. Okay, now it remains to bound t lambda of the g function. There's no good estimate on the Fourier coefficients in g. However, since the number of terms in gjm is nicely bounded by lambda to the two sigma, we can break each gj as a summation of big g functions. Basically, on each interval, we have big N terms in the Fourier series. So each GJ, GJ, we will pick one of those terms from each interval. So each big G consists of a summation over the cube of exactly one term from the Fourier series on that cube. Here the K can be willed as an assignment from M to the frequencies for GJM. For each small g, there, there are at most big N big Gs. So we can write T lambda of small g as a summation of at most lambda to the six sigma terms of G, T lambda of big G. And recall, we still have the freedom to choose the sigma here. So it suffices to prove that uniformly for all the big G i k i's, t lambda of big G i k i is bounded by lambda to the negative one half minus epsilon for some epsilon. Once we choose this epsilon, we can 
make the corresponding choice of sigma and then the corresponding choice of rho so that the whole scheme works. So how do we bound T lambda of big G i, J i? Again, we expand it into a sum. However, there's no summation over case because for each m, interval m, m, there's only one corresponding k frequency. So this is a submission over all the cubes in our decomposition of exactly one oscillator integral associated to that cube. Again, we use the same criteria for stationary cubes and non-stationary cubes. And we see that this sum will be bounded by the submission over measures of the stationary cubes. The remaining non-stationary cubes contributes a very small part to this uh, trilinear form. Now we are ready to reduce to a sublevel set estimate. So E, e sharp here is the total measure of the stationary cubes. However, because of the uniform bound on the second, der second order derivatives on the phase function phi, we can replace E sharp by a smoother version. Let's call it E sub H epsilon defined as all the X such that gradient j phi minus hj of xj is less than epsilon. We can compare this definition with the definition for the stationary cubes. We see that actually to connect these two definitions, just let hj of xj be the step function such that hj xj equals kj on the interval, and we are done. So now we finally reduced to a sublevel est sub level set estimate. Here I wrote down the definition for rank one non-degeneracy again to compare it to the lemma here. So the sublevel set estimate lemma says that if our phi is rank one non-degenerate and if we have uniform lower bound for the mixed second order derivatives of phi, then this sublevel set E has measure bounded by O of epsilon to the one plus delta. To explain this in words, basically the lemma says that combined with this definition for rank one non-degeneracy, it says that if the following system of equations does not have an exact solution, then the measure of the set where it has an approximate solution should be very small. We shall not jump into the proof of the sublevel set estimate, but in some spirits, it's a version of the Van der Korput theorem. As mentioned before, there are various ways to interpret this theorem and make generalizations both into higher dimensions and uh, into a larger class of phase functions, for example, uh, for C infinity or CK functions. Okay, thank you for listening.